and transcription. So welcome again to the Modern History Research Center and this talk by Professor Alan Forrest, who, as I said a moment ago, he's a world leading expert on the Napoleonic period. And he's going to come to talk to us about his latest book on the Atlantic slavery. And particularly, uh, the talk is entitled "Is uh, the Slavery a Napoleonic Blind Spot?" Um, so we're going to start sharing the screen at this moment. Hopefully, shall I put it as a slideshow, Alan? Yes, please. There we are. Would you like to go ahead? Okay. Just keep here when you want to click. This is the next slide. Well, the, well the, yeah. yeah. Or, or you can use here. Yeah. This oh, thanks very much indeed. I hold it here because I made. Okay. All right. Well, good evening and many thanks for your tolerance. Being in this, at this late hour. Um, my book was on a slightly broader topic. It was really about what I called the death of the French Atlantic, which covered the period from the uh, mid 18th century, from when the 15th century, so I'm afraid, for expanding, um, to essentially the period after 1815, when the slave trade had been officially designated as illegal. That didn't, of course, prevent some merchants and some uh, ship's captains from defying the law and continuing to, um, to, to, to trade. Just a little thing to say. It may be an idea to talk more to this side, just because the light is going to get in the eyes, and also the microphone is here in the lab. So, oh, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that better? That's perfect. Right. So today I wanted to extract from that the Napoleonic period and ask certain rather direct questions about Napoleon. I mean, Napoleon is seen by many people as a modernizer. In so many fields, he was. He, he modernized, he codified the law, he modernized the administrative system, he introduced gendarmerie, which meant that his empire was policed, not always, of course, to everyone's happiness and satisfaction. And he introduced education, lycée, and indeed the University of France. So there are so many ways in which Napoleon is a modernizer. He's a fairly secular figure, um, doesn't appear to have much religious faith, although on St. Helena, we know that there was a Catholic chapel in his private residence. But as far as government was concerned, he believed in a secular state, a powerful state, and equality of its citizens before the law. And in 1815, which is where to start at the end, in 1815, he abolished the slave trade. Just about the first decree he issued, um, and these are the terms, or the, the central terms, of that decree. But the slave trade is abolished, no ifs, no buts. There shall not be permitted any expedition for this trade, either in the ports of France or in those of our colonies, so neutral vessels couldn't arrive from, say, the United States with slaves. There shall not be introduced for the purpose of sale in our colonies any Negroes, the produce of this trade, whether by French or foreign vessels. The breach of this decree, those who ignore it, shall be punished by the confiscation of the vessel and cargo, be pronounced by our courts and tribunals, and then one last clause, which perhaps slightly qualifies these absolutes. Nevertheless, the persons who before the publication of the present decree shall have fitted out and dispatched vessels for the trade, people in Mont and Bordeaux and other ports who'd already uh, financed slaving expeditions, these people should be at liberty to sell their cargoes in our colonies. Well, these words may seem conclusive, and unambiguous. Um, it was just about the first decree he issued from the Tuileries after returning from his exile, the first exile from Elba. The slave trade was to be abolished in, 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 in simple terms. Um, Africans could no longer be bought and traded, 
and they could no longer be landed in French or French colonial soil to be sold into slavery. So it would appear that Napoleon at this moment in 1815 sided with the liberals. Um, he sided with those abolitionists, for instance, in Britain who had got the slave trade abolished in 1807 or in the United States who had done so a year later in 1808. But I think we have to see the decree in slightly political terms, uh, a decree which sends a clear signal to his supporters and to a wider audience across Europe that the returned emperor was on the liberal side. He was a progressive. He was a son of the revolution who could be depended upon to champion human rights and contribute to the end of, of slavery. Or so he wanted people to believe. But as with so much that Napoleon did and said, there was a strong element of propaganda in his gesture, which was aimed as much at establishing his place in history as at furthering the cause of those whom France had enslaved. His use of paintings and visual images to enhance his reputation as hero, savior and liberator um, are well documented. His resort to journalists too, in order to get his image and message across. He knew in Philip Dwyer's words, how to exploit the prevailing public mood. So I think we have to assume that his words on this issue as on others were chosen with intent. And it's hard perhaps to avoid reading a proclamation on the slave trade with more than just a pinch of cynicism. Because the circumstances of 1815 were unprecedented. And we're entitled to ask whether this newfound liberalism was anything more than an attempt to buy support from a part of the electorate that might be persuaded to back an imperial restoration. The political climate in France had changed considerable, considerably since the days of the consulate. And after his return from Elba and his march through the Dauphiné and, and Burgundy, gathering military support as he went, Napoleon knew that he had to rebuild his power base in the capital. If he could count on some support from the army, Conservatives in civil society would not support him because they, on the whole, rallied to the white flag of legitimism and the Bourbons. He therefore had little choice, it seems, but to appeal to liberals and to those who might otherwise be Republicans. And to this end, he set about establishing a new liberal empire. Slavery here is not a political issue. Calls for abolition were becoming more insistent both in France and abroad, as foreign governments began passing their own reforms and pressing for reforms from France. And during the first restoration in 1814, even Louis XVIII expressed his support for abolition. So Napoleon, in a sense, was in a corner, and it, his, his, his words in 1815, I think, must be interpreted and understood in that political context. It's difficult either to address the question without taking some account of the policy on slavery of those who preceded him and who set the economic and moral climate in which he grew up. And the slave trade in France in the 18th century was in no sense taboo. Its growth had been as sudden as it was dramatic. Before the end of the 17th century, French ships played very little part in the Atlantic slave trade, a tiny proportion. Spain, Portugal were the first in the field. Um, Britain, a much more important, much more powerful slaving nation by 1750 than France was. But after 1713, when the Guinea Company's monopoly ended, French ports invested seriously in slaving voyages, supported by the Crown through generous subsidy schemes. Between 1716 and 1793, for instance, French vessels transported over a million Africans to the Americas. And during the 15 years before 1793, and essentially the trade fizzles out and shrivels, they carried an average of 24,000 slaves each year. And slavery is not just about a few ports. If you look at the slaving ports of France, the period I'm talking about, they didn't all rise to prominence at the same moment. Shell was the biggest ones, but 
essentially you could have this book plus when my was been lobbying on which was the headquarters of the French East India Company, not powerfully involved day to day. You know, of all the cities I'm talking about, March was the one that was most attended. Rochelle, a Protestant city with lots of merchants with links across Europe, also a trading port, and, and Bordeaux. Uh, to a degree, also, you could say Marseille, although it's a Mediterranean port. Atlantic. So all, the, all these ports are involved, are heavily involved in slavery and the economy is heavily dependent. But look at the system. Not importantly, then, but with Paris and the market, um, Bordeaux would agree with the Bruce, Marseille, I mean, all these ports essentially serve towns in the interior, and these towns. To a large extent, are, are providing them with, with, with goods for the colonies. For instance, Bordeaux exports a lot of wine, and wine growing areas also um, exports a large amount of grain and flour in the mills of, of Asia. Um, and similarly, in the other way around, when goods come in, colonial goods come in. From, 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 from the Caribbean, then there are mills or factories on the Loire, in the towns of the Loire, that are converting these into textiles and, uh, and other goods. So the dependency, as in Britain indeed, the dependency of whole communities on the prosperity of the slave trade um, is, 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 is incredibly dense. And if it is threatened, then a large number of livelihoods are threatened with it. The Caribbean in the 18th century was being opened up by different European powers. Also, it has to be said by traders from the United States. We should never forget that there are uh, within the Americas there are slave traders who are dealing with Caribbean and indeed sending Africa. But essentially, Britain, with Jamaica. Spain with Cuba, France, Saint Domingue, now the western part of uh, Haiti. These are the, uh, the, the major powers. Denmark's involved to some extent, Holland's involved to some extent as well. And if you take the French contribution and look at French slave voyages, taking the long period from the middle of the 17th century when the first slave expedition must begin to the final date is a bit arbitrary, but I've taken 1831, uh, the beginning of the July monarchy, which was the first moment when you could say that the French government started policing its own slavers uh, seriously. Uh, and these are the sorts of uh, various parts of the same French century, And these are areas in which thought leaders and institutions who remain and the ships from, as you see, across the Caribbean, Guadeloupe and Martinique out in the Windward Islands, the main French colonies, and the colonies of Cuba. The scale of the operation is relatively small. The major destination is Saint Domingue, so called. Pearl des Antilles, as the French call it, the, the pride of the, um, of the Caribbean, and by far the richest um, sugar island. Sugar, to some degree, to go from cotton, but essentially sugar is a major product, and that's the one for which they need the largest number of plantation slaves to, 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 to bring in the crop. So the loss of Saint Domingue would be incredibly damaging to the economy and to the livelihood. Of a large number of people back back in France, uh, it would be, of course, extremely advantageous for the slaves themselves, if uh, if were possible, to run the economy, plantation economy, out slave labour. And I suppose the early years of Haiti are a kind of experiment 
can that. Uh, this is the western part of Haiti. What the French call it. Major. Yeah, see how once Haiti is, is independent. Um, quite a sophisticated town, by the way. Don't, don't think of colonial society purely in terms of plantations and slave labor in the countryside. This is an administrative center, got a trading center. French firms or companies will have their agents there. And it has become a full sized French provincial town. It looks like a French town in the 18th century. Two or Poitiers are or one of the, the many towns inside France itself. Um, there are other smaller around the, around the coast. And if I can just show you one or two images for a moment, uh, I take Bordeaux for the moment simply because Joseph Vernet is not a bad artist and, and painted it around 1760. But you see all these ships. The rather handsome merchant houses, which uh, the successful merchants of Bordeaux had built for themselves, um, and ships. It's all of them for the Atlantic trade. Not all slave ships. There was also direct trade. In other words, there are two types of, of commerce: direct, in which you take goods from France up wine for the moment, and you bring back colonial produce, or sugar, or molasses, and so on. And there is triangular trade, which will start in Bordeaux or not, heads for West Africa, as we've seen, take slaves out to sell in Saint-Domingue, and then return the third part of the triangle with a normal commercial cargo. So please notice, if you were here, if you were standing on the table top, 1770 or 1780s, you might know, if you were in the day, but it leaves the Garonne, same is true in Nantes, it leaves the port, got slaves on board, a cargo which is taken somewhere, it could be to the Caribbean, it could be to West Africa, and it comes back without slaves. And indeed, when the ship has left port, heading down towards the escape, a slave ship will have on board carpenters and others who will insert a second deck, hold, preparing the ship for a sort of twin deck or double deck of cargo or slaves once it gets to Africa. But the people back home, the people standing on the banks of the Loire or the Garonne, have no particular reason to feel shame. There's no outward sign. This is a slaving voyage. And if I move across the Atlantic to the Caribbean itself, I mentioned the cap a moment ago. This is the main square of the cap. This building is like this. You can see in many central towns. West, behind the building, um, square, well laid out. And there was a thing in the middle. Um, and, and indeed, the provisions, the cap had a theater. The cat had a Masonic lodge. If you wanted to carry on the kind of commercial affairs, the kind of it had a stock exchange, of course, uh, all, all the things you could do in Bordeaux, you could do probably in the cat as well. Now, under the revolution, France became the first country in the world to abolish slavery. Yeah, I'd be quite clear here. There was a difference between the slave trade and the institution of slavery. In Britain, the British, global force and all the rest, pat themselves on the back eternally for abolishing the slave trade, and that's why they did. They didn't abolish slavery. And the slave trade in Britain may have been illegal in 1807, but they still had slaves in Jamaica in 1837. But they simply were transported across the Atlantic and stopped. The French in 1794 
for political reasons, that this was, this was to be fair, there was a, a threat of in, insurrection in, 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 in Saint-Domingue at the time, the French abolished not just the slave trade, but slavery. It freed the slaves. And that, of course, was at the root of much of the violence that followed. Um, I can go into the detail later, it's not quite relevant today, but essentially, Saint-Domingue is, is a complicated character. It does not consist simply of white masters and black slaves. It also consists of three men of colour who are very often the children of mixed, so mixed marriages in some cases, or, 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 or um, masters who um, have children by female slaves, and then they become legitimised and you know, given their freedom. So they're actually free people. Whereas slaves are still technically property. So you have free men of colour, free people of colour, who are, if you like, mixed race. You also have free blacks, slaves who have been given, who have been accorded their freedom, usually as a reward for service, quite often when slave owner dies and then makes this concession in his or her will. So you have a slightly complicated society in which different groups have different interests. And the French in 1790 free the people of colour, the mixed race um, population. It's wonderful. They suddenly have all the rights that whites do. So you're in Saint Domingue, you're accustomed to a plantation economy, suddenly you have all the rights of whites. What do you do? You buy slaves. And many of the people of mixed race become deeply hated by the black slaves. Um, and, and, and in some cases, indeed, the relations between them are, are much worse. So you, you, you find the French are forced, in a way, in 1793-94, to free the slaves in order to persuade them to join the French against a possible insurrection by the people of colour. As I say, it's, it, it's, it's complicated. It's not, it's not a straight um, black and white situation. Now, into the bargain, of course, you get abolitionist pressures from outside, and particularly from England. Um, much of the propaganda about abolition, the French Revolutionary period, is based on writings, notably of the man on the left, Thomas Clarkson, who is probably the most influential abolitionist on the continent, he produces tracts which are translated into French and which are passed to the National Assembly, and uh, there was a group in France, a pressure group, called the Ami des Noirs, the Friends of the Blacks, uh, from 1788 onwards, uh, involving quite a number of leading, not German politicians, but Republican politicians in the Assembly, and they become a fairly consistent pressure group for the ending of the slave trade in France. Castleway has been included here because I suppose he is, across the period of, of, the, of the empire, the most involved politician. Um, and when it comes to the terms of the Treaty of Vienna, for instance, in 1814, at the end of the Napoleonic period, Castlereagh is there. Britain has given up the slave trade. It has no intention of seeing France making profits out of something that it has, if you like, sacrificed itself for as a, as a moral issue. So Castlereagh, uh, will be a leading spokesman trying to insist that the issue of slavery is included in the terms of the peace treaty that ends the Napoleonic Wars, um, and others who are involved too, including uh, the Duke of Wellington, who is also by this time uh, a, a, a leading political figure, a somewhat ambiguous political figure. He's deeply, deeply conservative, and he's not particularly interested in human rights in other contexts, but in this particular context, of forcing the French to give up uh, the slave trade, that he is quite uh, outspoken. This is simply an example of the kind of propagandist approach that we got time in England. But the contrast between what the French do to the people they colonize, eventually at least, and what the English do to the people they colonize. So where is the French? Opium to them, making a statement really 
pointable. Bristles are there kissing them on their cheeks. They're kissing them on their cheeks and, and giving them liberty and freedom. It wasn't quite like that, but you can see in its sort of idealized world, it would make great British propaganda and is the background to much of the negotiation in 1814. Go back to Clarkson for a moment. One of the most famous images that he produced, we know it from British abolitionism, uh, was the image of the two decks of the books, a slave ship from Liverpool um, in 1788, which had carried these unfortunate slaves to Africa, crowded on deck. Um, for six weeks or eight weeks of a dreadful voyage across the Atlantic. And this was the image that the, the British abolitionists put across, and that was a very popular image in France as well. It was circulating um, in the National Assembly. Not that they actually needed to look to a Liverpool ship to make the point. The Marie Seraphique of Nantes. Image uh, of the time. Um, the the place I think we know quite a lot about because it was the centre of a, of a court case uh, in France. But there you have images of the decks of a French, a not um, slave ship, which are not so different, so much better. And the images that we from the books. So, under the revolution, the French had actually abolished slavery, but they weren't really in a position to enforce it very effectively. I mean, apart from anything else, lost many of the Caribbean islands to the Spanish, to the British in the war in the 1790s. And neither the Spanish nor the British had any intention of abolishing slavery. Uh, Cuba, Jamaica were still at that time very left of the Sugar Islands for the slave economy. Um, and the other thing, of course, that um, by then, essentially, French trade across the Atlantic virtually disappeared. Look at the, the image across the entire 18th century, it's the same. Periods of war are periods when trade is reduced. Uh, merchants need peace. And from 1792, France is at war with the empires, Austria and Prussia particularly. From 1793, more importantly in, in the terms of this debate, France is at war with Spain, both Atlantic powers. And both Britain and Spain, and certainly Britain and Spain together, have a much more powerful navy than the French can muster, and so they control the sea lanes uh, across the Atlantic which means that the amount of trade from Bordeaux and Nantes and elsewhere, both in slaves and in everything else, diminishes dramatically. So the 1790s are a period when there's not a great deal of French slaving anyway, but it's probably less because of the change in the law than because of the change in naval conditions. As far as merchants are concerned, of course, these are two threats. War on the one hand, abolition on the other. Threats, long term threats to their trade <coughs> and their profitability. Well, this is the convention that I will pass this law in 1794, um, which um, abolished the slave trade and abolished slavery. And then, like all good revolutionaries, they sat back smugly and waited for other countries to follow their highly moral lead. And nobody did. So there's not an enormous change uh, in the climate um, in, the, in, in the 1790s. Um, it's Saint Domingue had a revolution. It had violence. It had a civil war. It had murders. Um, the slave trade that was abolished in, in, in Saint Domingue was abolished because of disorder, not because of um, France's uh, initiatives. 
And of course, the neighboring islands, Tobago, Jamaica, Cuba, remained unaffected by, by French legislation. And across the Black Atlantic, slaves continued to be transported from Africa and colonial produce to come back to France. Napoleon to decide what to do. And of course, there are two sides to the argument. We've talked about the abolitionist side, which is the highly public and highly moral one, but the merchants don't take this lying down. And merchant opinion, mercantile opinion, and I would venture to say it doesn't matter whether they're Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. Merchants all seem to have roughly the same pragmatic response to this, which is the slave trade is a trade, it's a commerce. Slaves are a cargo, they're property. You sell them, somebody buys them. From that point onwards, they're his property or her property, and it's not for government or for the law to interfere in a commercial arrangement. And so you get, um, just as the, the Amis des Noirs are arguing the case for abolition, so a club called the Club Massiac in Paris, which the supporters of the planter lobby in the Caribbean join, the Club Massiac is arguing against them. They are arguing that it's perfectly moral, it's perfectly right to conduct the slave trade. Indeed, that slaves are better off, sorry, Africans are better off in slavery than they would be if left in the misery of Africa, or, or so they say. So the case against abolition is put fairly forcefully, equally in a whole series of pamphlets. This one from Saint Malo as early as, as 1790. But the, the sense of it, the sense that there's nothing terribly cruel about the slave trade, maybe a few masters in the Caribbean who do it badly and get things wrong, but that can be overcome. There's nothing wrong fundamentally with the trade itself. And so you get this kind of pamphlet war between white and those who wish to preserve their profits and who warn, by the way, about the disaster that would be caused to the French economy where the slave trade is abolished, and the end of it, argued about them. Fundamentally, it's the moral issue, it is the moral issue of, the genera of, its, of its generation, and that therefore um, there's only one decent outcome, and that is certainly of the slave trade some of the day of slavery. So in 1793, they felt that their case had won. Slaves in France, well, gone then, because once you put your foot on French soil, you are automatically free. So any Africans that you see in France, and you will see quite a lot in the 18th century, personal servants and valets brought back by sea captains, slaves who have been freed in the Caribbean and are brought back to France, possibly to become servants, possibly to take up careers. Well, some of them are going for woodworking, some are things like, like hairdressers and so on. In France, uh, there'd be several hundred, certainly in Paris and probably in both Bordeaux and not. I mean, Napoleon in 87 does a kind of census of, of how many types of black people there are in France, and, and it comes up with a hundred or several hundred here and, and several hundred there. So if you are in Bordeaux or in Nantes and go down to the quays to, to the seafront, you will see black faces, and these people will not be enslaved. They will be they will be free. So the the idea of the plantation when it comes back to France may be coloured to some extent by the notion that these are smartly turned out, very often in a kind of domestic uniform, or indeed some of them go back as merchant seamen on ships back to the Caribbean. So there's a certain amount of free flowing, and the vision that the French had in African come through the slave system is probably a much more positive one than the reality. And you also get, I may say at this time, slightly folksy, slightly colourful, ornate idea that life in the Caribbean is, 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 is full of colour, it's full of signals. This is a kind of plate, a kind of illustrative art um, of the period, which shows some slaves down the path. Yes. 
cotton with sugar cane because it doesn't look particularly arduous, at least for French domestic farmers. So, in 1794, as I say, France abolished both the slave trade and the institute of slavery. This image, by the way, is not contemporary, but it comes from around 1848, when France does the same thing a second time. Because in between, of course, there is the period that we are talking about, the period of Napoleon, when he turns this policy. If you move to the consulate in Embro, move particularly to the years of the consulate, and Napoleon has been, he's, he's had his insurrection in Paris, along with Banas and others, the director has been overthrown, and he is first consul, and after 1802, first consul for life. The petitions from the trading towns to the government in these years are particularly heartrending. There are times when the population is going down, people who have been attracted to Bordeaux by its wealth, shall we say, in the 18th century, are going back to their villages because they're unemployed and there's no job for them. And the same is true, of course, in the Havre and Nantes and elsewhere. So there's a lot of pressure on the government. Uh, a couple of quotes here from the Empire. I'll take the lower one first. It comes from a German merchant, Florence Meyer, in 1801. The antique splendor of Bordeaux is no more. It is clear wherever you look. The stock exchange is still thronged with merchants, but most of them are just there out of habit. Business is rare. The internal trade in wine, the one that does not involve crossing the Atlantic, is the only one not to have disappeared. And slightly more dramatically from the American consul eight years later, grass is growing in the streets of the city. Its beautiful port is deserted, except for two marblehead fishing schooners and three, sorry about this misprint, and three or four empty vessels which swing on the tide. Uh, in other words, the port which I showed you in 1760 with these transatlantic trading boats, big ships um, ready to take expensive cargoes abroad, they've been made up, and you're left really with a rather different image of the Bordeaux waterfront. And this is a picture by Pierre Lacour in 1806, which shows essentially um, I've got some boats on the river that take note of going on. But essentially, the big ships, yes, they're still there. They're laid up at either river. They're open up to the keys and out of the docks. They're not bringing in any new prosperity. That's the economic side. The pressure, if you like, to do something to help economies of these cities. But there's also a political thing. And this one is quite significant. Under the revolution, the colonies, let's call them Martinique, Guadeloupe, French Guinea, Saint Domingue, but there are also colonies in the Indian Ocean, Bourbon, and so on. The colonies were treated rather as an extension of France. So the people who had rights in France would also have the same rights as they happened to be in the colonies. They had the same constitution, in other words. And if you look at the constitution under the Jacobins, the constitution of 1793, if you look at the constitution under the Directory, which is even more explicit in the year three in 1795, the constitution makes it clear that the colonies were to be treated as part of France. And indeed, the colonies had direct representation in the National Assembly. So there were members who represented the Indies, black members who represented the West Indies, sitting as members of the French National Assembly, the French Convention in Paris. But Napoleon changed that. And in the consular, the, the, the constitution of the consulate, you find that explicitly, the population of the colonies is to be treated differently. The new constitution 
is for France alone. Colonies, he believed, had to have special laws drafted for them or imposed from Paris. Inhabitants would no longer necessarily enjoy the same rights as Frenchmen, and they certainly would no longer enjoy direct representation in the French National Assembly. And this leads even more dramatically in 1802, and I urge you to compare the language of 1802 with where we started in 1814 and 1815. But in 1802, Napoleon, by decree, specifically restored the slave trade. So the benefits which had been granted under the French Revolution were withdrawn. In the name of the French people, Bonaparte was so proclaimed. Oh, okay. still bloody. Um, the colonies, the colonies which had been restored to France as a result of the Treaty of Amiens, Treaty of Islam. Uh, slavery will be maintained according to the laws and rules by the 4th And it would be the same in other French colonies, those beyond the Cape of Good Hope, that is to say. Again, the slave trade and the importation of slaves into these colonies will take place. Forming once again the laws and regulations that existed before 1789. So he's going back to the Ancien Regime, to the situation in the Ancien Regime. Now it's true that it starts off with the colonies which Britain had restored to France in 1801 at the Peace of uh, Amiens. And of course, in these colonies governed by Britain, slavery still existed. So all he was doing there was maintaining, he would say, the British system. Thereafter, it becomes quite clear he wants to turn, to overturn all the advances, all the, the progress made by the French Revolution in this field, and to return to a slave economy. And Toussaint Louverture and the leaders of Saint Domingue understood this only too clearly, and it was made worse in 1802 when Napoleon sent his brother in law Leclerc with an army to Saint Domingue to overturn the Haitian Revolution to destroy the Black Challenge to his regime. Um, this is celebrated, I may say, by uh, this particular painting at the time, by January Sushodolsky, uh, the Battle of Palm Tree Hill. And let us be quite clear, Napoleon's instructions to Leclerc were explicit. My policy, he said, is to govern men the way most of them wish to be governed. It was by making myself Catholic that I ended the war in the Vendée back in 1793 4. Um, he wasn't in power then, but he was in power in 1799 when the Vendée uh, crisis risked rekindling again and there was another insurrection. It was by making myself Catholic that I ended the war in the Vendée. In making myself a Muslim, but I established myself in Egypt. And so I will speak of liberty and the free part of Saint Domingue. I will confirm slavery in the Ile de France, that is uh, the. Uh, um, and even in the enslaved portion of Saint Domingue. They may make less sugar than when they were slaves, but they provide us and serve us as we need them as soldiers. If we have one less sugar mill, we will have one more citadel occupied by friendly soldiers. I think in this quotation, Napoleon shows two things. One, he doesn't frankly give a damn about slavery. So it's not a moral issue for him at all. It's something that we negotiate about. And he is willing to impose it, or he is willing to live without it. But there must be benefits to France. And the benefits that are most important to him are military. If he can get the loyalty of black West Indian soldiers, he is willing to give them a degree of liberty. If he can't, they might as well remain slaves. But there's, there's a deep cynicism, it seems to me, in the way Napoleon regards the issue. So, can I move back to France just for a moment? 
Napoleon clearly viewed colonies as a source of profit above all else. And it's questionable, it seems to me, whether he ever became convinced by moral arguments for liberation or indeed by free trade arguments. Essentially, colonies were things that should be used in a rather mechanicalist way for the benefit of France, and he was determined to impose laws that would ensure that. Um, race, it seems to me, does not figure particularly strongly in his argument. It is the economy that is uh, fundamental to him. Uh, he wants, in a way, and this is difficult, he wants, in a way, to, to establish peace so that he can exploit the colonies to the maximum. And I think there are moments when he appears to have something like a coherent colonial policy. I'm thinking particularly of these years of the consulate, when he is trying once again to regain, by military force, to regain Saint-Domingue and make it into uh, a submissive part of his empire. Because he knows that war in the Atlantic, war with Britain, is probably a war he's not going to win. Napoleon was a great general. He was a great tactician on land. He wasn't a great tactician at sea. And it's, it's partly, it's not his fault. I mean, he's a military man. He's, a, he's an artilleryman. And that's his training. But it's partly also that he doesn't really understand the Navy, it seems to me. Um, France had, it's one of the reasons, I think, why British usually win wars with France in the 18th century. Britain, the British Navy, the Royal Navy, is always much stronger, almost always, much stronger than the French Navy. There was one moment at the end of the American War of Independence in 1781 when technically France is the dominant power in the Atlantic. But in the years between 1781 and the Revolution, Napoleon tries, sorry, Napoleon, the French try to renew their fleet. And the British, seeing what they're doing, spend three times as much to renew theirs. Britain always has the tax base. And it always, it seems to me, has the tradition of an island that the, the dominant means of defence in an emergency is the navy. Now, once the two navies meet it, in the revolution and the empire, it becomes fairly clear which is the strongest. Yes, there were mutinies in the British army at the Nord. There was a moment when Britain might be afraid that French revolutionary ideas would subvert its own fleet. But essentially, for the French Navy, it was in a dreadful state. Uh, a large number of naval commanders were deeply royalist. The French Navy was not called La Royale for nothing, um, and simply abandoned their posts in the early revolution. Um, when the first direct engagements take place, uh, the French Navy is essentially held back by Britain, by the British blockade, and, and so spends a large part of the war in port, in Brest and in Toulon, where it's ineffectual. Um, obviously, the direct engagement with Nelson at the, at the Nile and uh, at the Bay, as it's very often called in French, and at uh, Trafalgar, uh, lead these uh, overwhelming victories for, for Britain. All this means, in a sense, that the French Navy is unable to control the Atlantic. The British can send naval vessels with convoys, commercial convoys, across the Atlantic more or less at will. When the Peninsular War starts, the French have also antagonized Spaniards, and Spain also has a fairly significant navy in this period. There are all sorts of reasons, it seems to me, why the war, despite Napoleon's dedication to the war and winning, is going to undermine any consistent colonial policy he might have. And so it seems to me he sends, as, as we have seen, his army out in 1802. Toussaint knows how to defeat it. Partly the, the soldiers are brave, partly they're patient. They wait until yellow fever hits, and just as it hit the British at 
Bulgaria and other places. It hit the French um, in, in 1882 and 1883. So Haiti becomes, Haiti becomes a, an independent state. The French have lost the, the richest and most valuable possession in the Caribbean. And from that point onward, Napoleon seems to lose interest, hence uh, selling, off, <coughs> selling off Louisiana to the United States in the following year. There isn't really a consistent Caribbean policy at this time. Um, you'll find that because of the racial hatred on both sides in Saint-Domingue, that French settlers are not very welcome to stay. The risk of massacre is fairly strong. So many of them, most of them, leave Saint-Domingue. So there aren't the French plantation owners there with whom you could trade even if you wanted to. Um, many of them they don't know what to do. Many go back to France. Others believe that Saint-Domingue will eventually become a slave economy again. They may go to places like Jamaica temporarily. Others give up on Saint-Domingue, but they go to Cuba, a Spanish colony where slavery still flourishes. And then in 1807, 1808, Napoleon invades Spain, thousands of miles away in Europe. And it does, of course, antagonize the Spanish monarchy. And one of the first orders it gives is to the governors in Cuba to kick the French out. So the French settlers who had come from Saint-Domingue, who had settled very often in Santiago de Cuba, which is a sort of French enclave um, on, the, on the island, had to move on again. And it's then that many of them hit the United States, come into Norfolk, Virginia, come into Charleston, come into New Orleans and may make a career on the side of the Atlantic. Others, of course, dribble back to France uh, where they, well, spend their ill-gotten gains on other things. But war and Napoleon's dedication to war does not help, it seems to me, with consistent policy. And if you look back across the 18th century, this is the, the pattern that we're getting. Chart from the the economy is <laughs> so down. But if you look at the balance sheet, it corresponds more or less to France, particularly if you're playing in France. With Britain, um, wars with Britain are, are not about the same things, they tend to be about colonies. The Seven Years' War actually started in the colonies, um, and um, these are the periods when it's impossible without a dominant navy to continue to trade safely. I mean, you can trade, but losses mount. Insurance rates go through the sky in these periods. The conditions for commercial trade uh, deteriorate. Um, the government, the French government, and indeed the British government, it's the same, encourage their merchant fleets to arm themselves, to become corsairs or privateers. Um, which is essentially a little bit like piracy. So instead of going to all the effort of sending a ship all the way to Africa and out to the uh, to, to, to the colonies, isn't it much better to send it two or three days offshore and hope you can intercept a British ship coming the other way and take it prisoner and have its cargo? And both sides are doing this uh, during, during periods of war. So for all sorts of reasons, it seems to me, uh, the dedication to trade, the dedication to commercial prosperity, the continued interest in the case of the colonists and of the merchants in the French ports diminishes. And it's perhaps just worth mentioning that the interests of the colonists and the merchants are not necessarily the same. And certainly during the revolutionary period, the colonists wanted more freedom from France. They wanted the freedom to trade their goods directly to the Americans without bothering with these long journeys uh, back, to, back to France, and certainly without all the paperwork um, uh, 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 of French monopoly. So there were already tensions between the planters and the merchants. Uh, Napoleon was much more sympathetic to the merchants, as you might imagine, but um, for a variety of reasons, largely political, um, Serves essentially to support them or their economy through the period, with the result that almost all these Atlantic ports, 
fall into a temporary, and in some cases, a, term, a permanent decline. Let's move forward to 1814, because, as I say, Britain, in particular, has this almost obsessive interest in slave trade. And the Congress of Vienna is not really about the slave trade. Congress of Vienna is about finding a peace settlement after 25 years of war, um, rearranging borders, getting the French to pay for some of the costs of the damage they have inflicted, and the rest. So essentially, the negotiations of Vienna are not about slavery. Um, the outcome will be now, Russia gets back a lot of the territory it had lost in six, which was fine. Russia does pretty well in the east, particularly in Poland. Um, Britain grabs some whole colonies overseas, which was Britain's main interest in all these negotiations. And the French have to accept um, an army occupation. It's complicated because Napoleon comes back, as you know. There's a necessary extension of the conflict with it. Uh, and after that, Alexander I in particular, the British to some extent, are determined that this should never be allowed to happen again. So the terms get more severe. France is restored to its 1790 frontiers, essentially. There is an army of occupation that stays there for three years until a large indemnity is paid off. These are really the terms that interest the delegates. At Vienna. But the British keep coming back, keep harping on about the slave trade. They have given it up. They're determined that other people should as well. And they little by little persuade some of the other countries to agree. I mean, Prussia doesn't have much to give up because it doesn't really indulge in the slave trade. So they sign up pretty enthusiastically. Denmark, Portugal, it. Little by little, some of the smaller countries, if you like, are, are persuaded uh, to give up the slave trade. But the main aim of the British um, in the peace negotiations is to get a similar concession. Um, Louis XVIII, as we've seen, expresses himself in fairly liberal terms. And as a result of all this, negotiations end, as negotiations often do, moderately optimistically without an awful lot being actually achieved. Britain had no wish to let France resume a trade which the British had announced, and Louis XVIII is forced to accept that France will relinquish the slave trade, but only after about three years, and he wants a moratorium to allow merchants to adjust. And so it was that they agreed that after a period of time, the French would give up the slave trade. Nothing about slavery. And as you might imagine, the trend was then to take younger slaves, to take more female slaves, uh, and then to have um, the possibility of producing a new generation of slaves without the slave trade, and they're both doing it in the islands themselves. So it's not entirely the solution that Wilberforce might have wanted, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's better than nothing. The result for some in the, slave, in, the, in the slave imports is decline. For some, it simply means that you shut up your shop, you beat your ships, you sell them off for scrap, and you give up trade. That's particularly true in Nantes, which seems to be the town and the city that is least able to adjust to forced slavery order. Um, merchants in Marseille, and to some extent in Bordeaux as well, turn eastwards more and more. If the Caribbean is excluded, then let's trade with the island, with, with Madagascar and with the islands of the Indian Ocean. And these trades develop, and by the 1830s and 1840s, you're also getting um, expeditions, voyages, going all the way to Southeast Asia and China. So one effect of this is actually to force or to bring forward um, 
more imagination and more diversification um, in French trade and practice. And then, as we know, in 1830, the beginnings of a new French empire. A lot of the 18th century French empire had been in the Americas and it was lost by the time of Napoleon. But with the um, first um, expedition to Algeria, the opening up of French North Africa, you get a, a new period developing. There's also a French colony in Senegal. There, there, there are various bits of Africa that are beginning to look enticing for trade and for profit. Um, and so some towns decay, some ports readjust. Um, and some just carry on. Anyway, if I can take perhaps the most famous of the merchants, just Thomas Dubre um, of Nantes. Um, father had been one of the biggest slave trades, so the slave traders in the port in the 18th century. The son develops a passion for the Orient and for Oriental art. Um, trades with the East and by the next generation has become a notable collector of um, Oriental art, which he then donated to his native city. So that the museum in Nantes, it, the Musée d'Aubray, is, is actually a, a wonderful uh, artistic collection of Asian art. But the illegal trade continues. We shouldn't pretend, I think, that everything has been resolved by the Treaty of Vienna. If you look at the two cities which do most, although more than Bordeaux, most illegal trading um, after 1815, uh, you see the, the pattern that exists. Think of Bordeaux, and the cities are so small compared with the 18th century. The huge effect has taken place, but you are still getting. Um, from the Bight of Biafra. We can't, of course, go to Saint Domingue anymore because the, the biggest market has been lost and is now in France. But they are going to the Indies, to Spanish Cuba. Um, smallish figures, perhaps. But nonetheless, it shows the diversification, the possibility that the merchant ships from the park still carry on. So, particularly from the north, that's much more likely to carry on. Actually, as you can see, and these are very narrow lines. So, we're talking about six thousand. Not ships going to Cuba, going to Spanish. As America as well. So merchants will find a way around. And a lot depends, of course, on the figure with which they are posed. And we know that in the period after 1807, the British were highly inclined. To use the Royal Navy to try and disrupt French slave voyages. They had a few ships off West Africa. The Sierra Leone uh, was the, 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 the center for that operation, and they arrested a number of vessels and brought them back into port. When I say the illegal trade, after the Louis XVIII has signed up to it, it means the French Navy is also, perhaps not altogether enthusiastically, but it's also engaged in arresting French ships. And that's one reason why the numbers uh, go down fairly, fairly dramatically. But the illegal trade carries on. And if you go today, by the way, to Nantes, they have a memorial capable slave ship on, was built on the banks of the Loire. And, and on the pavement above, there are little oblongs, each of them with the name of a ship and the date of a, of a, of a slaving voyage in the period after the illegal, uh, after the law had made slaving illegal in 1815. It's quite an impressive display, the number of ships, the number of ships captains who were still slaving at that time. Again, moods changed. 
we are now in the age in which quite clearly slave trade is a source of disgust and apprehension to some extent. And it's quite clear if you look around French cities that little by little, they were slower in Britain and slower in America. Museums have started, as it were, exposing the French contribution to the slave trade. Memorials, statues have started to appear in, in French city streets, including the streets of the uh, cities that were involved in the slave trade. Not that I want to talk about today, but I will finish since we are in the age of statue toppling and cancel culture of one sort or another. And I finish with the Empress Josephine. And that is her statue as it is being attacked by a crowd in Nord de France in the capital of Eat, where she had stood. Josephine rather than Napoleon, simply because Josephine, the first empress, uh, was actually looking ahead to be one of those, as it were, as well as one of France's uh, major figures. So here she is being toppled. The statue is still there, but it's headless. That perhaps is a, a reasonable symbolic way to terminate the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to be giving priority to the people who are here for questions. Uh, oh, what happened with our um, hope they didn't cut us off. Uh, no, we are still here, thank goodness. <laughs> so but it's just amazing. There we are. Wonderful. Excellent. So um we stop sharing here hopefully. There we are. We're back here. So we'll start with questions here in the room. Yes, Raphael, yes. Um you know going back to uh, uh Haiti I was very curious about what you have to say about um you know, the, the free born um mixed race um people. You said that they were they were against the French Revolution. Just uh, I'm so confused with. I mean, when the French Revolution abolished slave, or at least slave trade, the people that the um, I mean, the, the mixed race people there who were free, I mean, you're saying that they were despised by the. I think it's complicated because views change from moment to moment. Under the Ottoman regime, I think it was fairly clear. The provincial governments, which were in charge of life in all the provinces of Saint Domingue, um, the people of colour were demanding rights. So at that time, they could be seen as being, if you like, on the political side. If they wanted the same rights for themselves, they didn't say anything about slavery. They were not in favour particularly of abolishing slavery, but they wanted rights for themselves as reborn. They were themselves not enslaved, so. Very rarely, because their father, possibly, that would give them rights. But um, they wouldn't give them all the rights they wanted. So um, what they demand is liberty. They, they, want, they, they want freedoms for the people. And when the French backed that, which I think was 1790, earlier than it was, whatever they want. Then after the situation turns in some ways rather nasty for them, the slaves are becoming more violent, poverty is being attacked. Um, they get rather frightened too. And the last thing they want, it seems to me, is for slavery to end. Partly because slaves are the whole point of the field of Sunday morning, not in a plantation, and the 
popular feeling, the belief at the time was that you couldn't really have a country to arrive at. So that was very interesting. There was a time when um, they sent out France to work in Europe. That was back to the 1730s, 1730s, looking for some form of white labour for But they didn't. So the, the, the three men of color wanted to be plantation owners. And as plantation owners, they go to that. I think we have another question. Javier, yes. I think the idea that we take on whether one would make sense economically. And it's also interesting what you were mentioning earlier with uh, what and the idea originally friends and your friends. And yet, there were for a year of course, about people think that's not possible. And, uh, and also, I think something that is good is the idea that the thing, for example, the question of the citizens and citizenship is too much targeted towards white men. And the like, who's really thinking that well, the women also were well, the black men in this uh, declaration. So, I was wondering if. How do you situate this sort of debate for Macron like, himself? I mean, does he need the law that he pays all these voices that are saying that what is really this French constitution just uh, uh, do they include also uh, the black? Or is he uh, really just the border for this and just go and say this is more politics and it's not? It's, it's, it's a wonderful question because, in so many ways, the things that we raise today um, were all being raised at the time, but possibly by minority groups or by by, by particular lobbies. I, I don't think they ever became. Well, certainly, the idea of women voting ever became central. If you take some of the clubs, uh, able to formulate their own rules about membership and so on, because they're not part of the, the state apparatus, if you take some of the clubs, they do have mix. So, yes, even at the time, um, you're beginning to have women. Place. Also, a place of women sometimes, 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 not many. It's only an issue that involves uh, the colonies. And hence, at that stage, it becomes part of this whole And the three people. Once, just that they ruled all black people who were enslaved and had no constitutional rights. In. I think probably for most French people, um, not concerned with their. But on the Jacobin agenda, yes, it does come up from time to time. And when you have one or two actually quite notable deputies, just you think what just you think what but I agree with you, it seems to be colonies as a resource on the one hand, rights of man as a right to 
statement, so it's a fight. I think we're tittering on the edge of terrorism. I think we're tittering on the edge of further insurrection or further, further revolt. We're going to erase these things. They're not central to the. Now, the problem for the Israel revolution, the difficulty for the Israel Says, but it's a sermon. Um, it's a sermon. It's a sermon where. It's a sermon where. It's a sermon where. It's a sermon where. I mean, they have rights on the island, but they wouldn't, I think, gain the same respect or have the same rights. Oddly enough, born in 1769, of course, of that. Many years, obviously, born in Irish nobility, of course, didn't have quite the same status in England either. So there are parallels between them. What's the old Jacobin? Well, Ross Book in 1792, called Dini Abbott which consists of a kind of conversation with different brother representatives. And William's voice is one of those characters who is the threat of him. He also makes friends. This is up to, depends how you put it. Um, Salicetti, who is a Corsican and a Jacobin leader in Marseille. So he has links with the Jacobin movement of 1794, but it is particularly useful to have links with Jacobin movement. Not so useful in 1794. Then, there are the So it seems to me he's a military man, Finland, first and foremost, very successful general, but he does, he dabbles in the press, he uses professional journalists. His own journal for the Army of Italy, for instance. He's aware of the power of the political word, and he's particularly aware of the power of the fact that even when he's in Italy, he is feeding journalists tidbits, that they can put in their papers at the right moment back in Paris. So it is very difficult to say what he really believes and what he thinks is useful to him. Um, in his ascent to power. But yes, a political general tied to a political regime in using, as we've seen, recognizing the benefits of a liberal agenda in certain normal world purposes. Does he believe it? Yes. You um he started the talk and also is mentioned in the publicity of your talk, uh, this statement of Napoleon during, I guess, the 100 days when he actually reverts his mm. position. So was this as a result of the Congress of Vienna and what's happening that he needs to actually show that he's is still a modernizer in some way and that now being a modernizer may include emancipation of the slaves? Well, that's what liberals have been saying and he wants their vote. Now, there is evidence from the 1790s that, yes, he supported some of these causes about human rights. There is also evidence from the 1790s that once he was in power, he needs an order first and foremost. And if there was a clash between the rights of the individual and the rights of the state, it's inevitably on the side of the state. There's a very ambiguous quotation from Napoleon on Ambiguous because what does it mean? Does it mean I'm going back to the Ancien Regime? I'm not a revolutionary? Does it mean we've had enough turbulence of insurrection and continual revolution and we just want to tell you things and bring it to an end? Probably. <laughs> but that still makes him, if you like, a conservative revolutionary. On the other hand, he's also a pragmatist. If you look at the liberal things he does, education and so on, 
is looking to prove he took a personal interest in the political force. This is isn't a lot of fighting going on, to be fair, but he takes a personal interest. He's, he is there with officers, with his advisors, and the rest, as they carefully qualify the regime and onto which the revolution a pile of revolutionary decrees, but without ever actually sorting out the mass of the right system. The full anticipations of the understanding, you see the answer. Ministers of strict services can be set up, departments, districts, communes, canton. Find it very impressive in a way. Every department, take your justice, take justice to the What does it mean? Every department, just here, in the department, just here, here, tribunal, tribunal, things, the number of sub prefectures. Each of these will be a tribunal per excellence. But the legal violence is an idea that is especially pleasant to me. So, at the cantonal level, Canton is three or four or five communes pieced together. At cantonal level, he'd appoint a justice, well, not personal, he'd appoint justices of the peace, juge de paix. He would not be able people from the local community who understood where the votes went and, and families were in dispute with his other families in the villages. And his job essentially was to hang votes together and sort things out. Now, an emperor who thinks all this through, with his advisor, I'm not saying he's not, is in some ways a little bit certain about the ability to be considered a civil war, obviously carried out in a crisis mode. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make this clear. And I think that's what he meant to everybody. Um, so, He's not one to put up society at all. That's the other thing I'm going to impress you. In Polyonic uh, poets, everybody was a People who well, were the people who promote both in the military and in civil administration, he does a merit back to that. Loyalty. He doesn't really care who you are. If you are a noble and also a human, you've got into emigration during the more radical periods of the French Revolution. And now you have everyone suspicious of you, but actually, if you were loyal to him and gave him service, well, if you look at these marshals, particularly the early period, probably they were really great soldiers. Dan, perhaps his favourite marshal, and then was the son of a peasant from the miserable son of a. You've got people who are being taken from all backgrounds and being promoted for their wealth. The revolution didn't do that. The revolution was very, very interested in. It undid a lot of the privilege of the SFP. Created, if you like, the level playing field that Napoleon could build on. But making that something permanent and all inclusive, it seems to be, was in Napoleon. So, yes, I, I give him credit for that. But I think there were limits. And I think slavery is one of them. 
we have uh, patiently patricia has been waiting on land for to, to to give us her question if she's still around <laughs> patricia would you like to give us your question you had to unmute hello yes. uh, hello can you hear me brilliant yes. thank you very 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 interesting um and very provocative can, can i just take you back slightly you talked about a stage when Slaves um, arrive back in France, and as soon as they step on land, they become free. Some then go to Paris, and they are what I call of good appearance. They're skilled, and um, they look um, a, a suitable cl clothing, for want of a better word. How far do you feel that appearance of them, and the Parisians and how they saw them, retarded the abolition of slavery from that point because these were arriving and appeared to be doing okay thank you did, did you manage to hear more yeah. or less but what she's asking is, is how far the fact that black people in, when they arrived to france uh, they became free and essentially they, they were well dressed and they were given a positive vision of what being a black person was actually had a detrimental effect on the emancipation of uh, black people in the colonies. Yes. It's, it's a very good question. Um, under the Ancien Regime, I, I don't think the question of emancipation ever really arose because the colonies were seen in a mercantilist way as being uh, for, contributing to the to the uh, wealth and prosperity of France. Um, so in that sense, I don't think there would have been a movement under the revolution, on the other hand, but under Napoleon, when so much was in flux, I, I think the fact that you could see decent fellow human beings um, on the streets of, of your city, dressed smartly, performing a useful function in society, I think this must have had an effect of some sort. Now, whether it was to create this revolution, whether it was to suggest that things were actually okay, or, or whether it might even have been the opposite. It might have been to say, well, people like this should not be treated badly. I mean, they did know, they did know increasingly about the abuses of power by plantation owners, for instance, in the, in the islands, the images of, of slaves being whipped in the sugar supply cane fields and so on. Um, what, 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 Common cartoons and, and caricatures and representations of that. Common. So I, I'm not sure that it retarded it, but it surely has brought home to people in terms of human beings and that claims that they were simply commodities to be treated or to be abused as they wanted wished would be more difficult to explain. I don't think it would have been tardy anything in the 18th century because there wasn't a campaign against slavery until, of course, the last years of the Ancien Regime. So many things were being questioned. Um, and in the Cahiers de Valence in 1788, communities up and down France are asked about their opinions for reform and change. And you do find, yes, in some areas, um, you do find the history of slavery coming up, but it is very much a split history between the commercial interests, which are saying we must retain slavery, benefits of France, and the traditionalists who increasingly say the human beings uh, the land must apply to them as well. So it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, could it in some cases have retarded the case for the form? I'm not sure. I haven't found any evidence, or, or, but it's not impossible. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, Raphael, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I think I, I just momentarily forgot what I left the cause. Um, Take your time. Take your time. Oh, yes. Um, uh, I mean, I'm going to write you, um, you know, Britain's um, late uh, August um, you know, slave trade. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Um, 
felt it was to tend to think this sort of, um, you know, sort of abolitionist uh, crusade that was um, merely to, um, I mean, that like, like behind the force, like, like legitimately behind the force of, you know, freeing slaves. And but how much of it was simply to um, attack France economically, because given that France was a very dependent slave, mm -hmm. I'd, it's hard to be speculated to trying to um, undermine France. That, of course, is what the um, slavery lobby in France thought and said many times over. The fact that this propaganda was coming from Britain um, was a deliberate attack on France. Now, if you look at the abolitionists in Britain, they would be slightly horrified to suggest that that was their major objective. Um, but here's the thing largely not before, quite often free who have religious views which push them in the direction of, of abolitionism. I think they believe that. But in France, there's no, no real power. The Ami des Noirs drunk in the ideas of the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment is a secular movement. I don't think either of them, or the Protestants in France, are, are particularly towards Said and said, I think I'm right to say the first time, then slavery. As far as this debate is concerned, so um, no, I, I think the views of the British abolitionists were on the board, but there would of course be fifty suffrage in Germany or something that made that. That sacrifice for our principles. So the idea that there's an attack on right to manage the economy in that way is not absurd. I'm sure national interest and conformist conscience come together quite quite neatly. Okay. Do we have any burning question? Otherwise, Professor Forrest has been talking for two hours non-stop. <laughs> so, and, and, and really fascinating talk, and, and the people online are still following, which is brilliant. Um, any other questions? So, we should say thank you very, very much. Really fantastic talk. Great, really. Thank you very much, people, also at home. Bye bye. <laughs>